Tuesday was looking at our ionization energy. So we've got these two general trends. Uh, and I believe with you guys, we talked about those trends, but we'll go ahead and talk through them again. Um, so in general, when we look at the ionization it, energy, it increases as we go from bottom to top within a group. So within a column, why would the ionization energy get more as we go up? What's that? So what's happening as we go within a column, okay, as we go from bottom to top within a column? We're decreasing our energy levels, so we're getting closer and closer to the nucleus. The closer our electrons are to the nucleus, the more neutral they are, the lower in energy. The lower in energy, the more energy it's going to take to kind of rip them out of the nucleus. So we could go all the way back to those line diagrams that I had set up to begin with. Okay. Um, so within a column, we would predict that because of our energy differences between each of those outer shell electrons. If we look within a row, that one's a little bit trickier. The ionization energy increases in general as we go from left to right across the period. Okay. Why would that make sense? Okay. We're still adding more electrons, so why do we not see the same trend as we would see with, uh, within a column? Where are those electrons going? To the, within a row, they aren't going away from the nucleus. They're actually staying at that same distance away. Okay, so relatively the same energy. Okay, so we would expect no real difference in the ionization energy, except what else changes when we go across a row? The number of protons. Our nucleus becomes more and more positive. If we take our electron and instead of putting it further away, put it in the exact same space, that positive charge is going to hold it a little bit tighter. So as we go left to right, we would expect that energy to again increase because our nucleus is now holding it a little bit tighter. Okay? Uh, and we have to say in general, when we go through and look at our uh, trends, because it's really coming down to our electron configuration. It depends where that electron is located. And what we've specified so far is kind of the bulk differences. Okay, we haven't looked super close at the electron configurations. Whoops, I thought I had another slide in there. And if you remember back to looking at that chart, if we looked at the uh, energies as we went down a column, that in general dropped. Okay, that one's pretty consistent. The one left to right, we had some exceptions in there. One of those exceptions was boron versus beryllium. All right, if we take a look at beryllium, what's our electron configuration? I'm not quite sure what you said there. Did you say four or full? Four. Uh, beryllium has four electrons, so we have to put those into the orbitals. Where do we start putting our electrons? A 1s. How many electrons fit in the 1s orbital? Two electrons. Okay, now we'd have to move up to the 2s. How many electrons fit in the 2s? Two. We've now satisfied all of the electrons for beryllium. There's our electron configuration. If we shifted to, say, boron, what happens in the case of boron? 1s2, 2s2, and 2p1. Why would the ionization energy for beryllium be higher than that for boron? So with boron, we could look at it and say that we have this really easy single electron to remove. And if we remove that electron, our electron configuration now looks very symmetric. We've got just s orbitals. Everything's nice and evenly balanced out. If we go through and look Conversely, at the beryllium, it's already perfectly symmetric. All of our electrons are filled within our orbitals. We're in s orbitals, which are also super symmetric. What's the issue there? Well, if I remove an electron from it, do I have that same symmetry? No, I lose a little bit of the symmetry. So beryllium doesn't want to give up that electron, whereas boron is a lot more willing to because then it can look somewhat stable. So we can evaluate these trends left to right for our ionization energies based on the electron configurations. 
You can fully expect multiple choice questions where they match the trend exactly. And then I might ask uh, a show your work question, which really isn't going to be a lot of work, but might ask you to explain why does boron have a lower ionization energy than beryllium? Because that goes against the trend. That would require an explanation. I can't ask a multiple choice question there. Okay? Would yes? that be because it, because it gives away that? It's going to give away which electron for boron? It's going to give away the 2p electron. Why the 2p? Because that only has one. So we got a couple explanations. We could say there's only one there, so it's easier to get access to it. Okay. Another big explanation I heard is that's also our highest energy. Okay. Remember, your p orbitals are higher in energy than your s. Okay. Kind of makes sense with that. I believe the next thing I talked about was looking at the electron affinities. Um, this table is not the greatest one, and it's not as far as I can tell, shown in your textbook. So we're just going to kind of cursorily, I think I said that right, look at this. Um, what the electron affinity is, is ultimately the reverse. It's the energy released when we take an electron from the vacuum and bring it into the atom. Okay, well, we're going to lose some energy because an electron in the vacuum has nothing to stabilize it, nothing to neutralize it. Okay, it doesn't have that nucleus. So when we bring it into the atom, it's now going to be partially stabilized by that positive of our nucleus. That loss in energy is your electron affinity. Okay? And the reason why your textbook doesn't introduce it is because we're dealing with this released. The sign on the energy goes negative, and everybody gets confused. Okay? So let's think of it in a slightly different perspective. Okay? What charge does the atom become if it takes an electron from the vacuum? It's become negatively charged. Why should it be negative? starts neutral and it brings in an electron, what charge is the electron? Negative. So what's going to happen to your overall charge? It's going to become negative. We're going to have a surplus of electrons. And since our electrons are negatively charged, our atom becomes negatively charged. Okay? This is the larger issue here. Why should I mention or why should we mention both of these? Well, it turns out our atoms are going to respond in very particular chemical fashions. And some of that is going to be dependent or related to this electron affinity or the ionization energy. Okay, but slightly. What we're primarily concerned about, please say, alter them, yes, is this concept known as electronegativity. Okay, Linus Pauling went through and started evaluating bonding, okay, and he noticed some individual patterns associated with it. So in general... Your metals became positive. Your nonmetals became negative. He said, okay, there's got to be a reason behind why that's actually occurring. So he could go back to the ionization energy and the electron affinities and start to use that information to determine why one might be positive, one might be negative. Okay? So what he went through and did is coined this new term, electronegativity. It's not really an electron affinity, and it's not really an ionization energy. And that's because the electrons that we're talking about when we look at electronegativity are not electrons going into the vacuum or being pulled out of the vacuum, but we're looking at electrons being pulled away from another atom. Okay, so it's a bonding electron. This is going to become massively important for every chemistry class you would ever uh, interpret. When you're looking at general chemistry, it's really underplayed as far as its overall importance. When you move into organic chemistry, Second semester organic chemistry, why a reaction actually works. Roughly 60, 70% of the time, it comes back to electronegativity. Okay, so it's a really, really important concept to understand because when we're looking at chemistry, we're ultimately concerned about the interactions between two elements or two atoms. So that's really what's happening with our electronegativity. We're looking at that bonding uh, ability. Pauling came up with his own scale uh, and it's typically the scale that's used, and that's what you're seeing in this figure relative to heights. Your most electronegative element is fluorine. Okay, and I know it's not easy to see on this. Fluorine's the tallest one here. What happens with helium, neon, and all of our noble gases? Can anybody see? Where are those relative to everything else? They're flat. Okay, they have no electronegativity that we can measure. Why? 
they don't react. There's no reason for them to react, and electronegativity is the ability to measure bonding electrons. Well, if your noble gases never form bonds, should they really have an electronegativity to speak of? Probably not. Okay? So, general trends, we can remove our noble gases when we evaluate our electronegativity. Our most electronegative is fluorine in the upper right-hand corner, and then our least will be cesium in the lower left-hand corner. Okay? Does that trend sound kind of familiar? Seen something similar to that? Maybe the inverse of that relationship, where fluorine is the least something and cesium is the most something? Metallic. Cesium is our most metallic. Fluorine is our least metallic. Electronegativity is the inverse of your metallic character as well. Okay, so if you don't like memorizing the electronegativity, you've already looked at your metallic character, you can memorize it based off of uh, metallic properties as well. Yeah? So within the electronegativity, um, I didn't have time to actually look up the explanation on this. I have a feeling that th that row of elements ends up being so much more reactive, it's a difficult to put an electronegativity number on. Someone just didn't measure it. Okay. Pauling scale was something that he kind of uh, developed based on what he observed in individual reactions, and he was somehow able to quantify it. I don't know exactly how we put those numbers on it. One method to look at, someone else came along later and said we could do this with values that we already have information about. We could go back to the ionization energy and the electron affinity, and they effectively took the average of those. Okay? Because that's ultimately what electronegativity is measuring, the ability to take an electron or to release an electron, very similar to your ionization energies, okay, your ionization and your electron affinity. Okay? We will come back to this uh, when we look at bonding, because it is really, really important. Okay? We can also use it for another uh, idea. If we were going to expect uh, to put fluoride and, say, sodium into a structure, okay? and they're going to, whoa, that's a table. Uh, what charge? would we expect? What would we happen, expect to happen to the electrons between a sodium atom and a fluorine atom? So sodium comes in. Uh, that's a little bit big. Let's pick something smaller. Let's pick uh, lithium. If with lithium, we've got 1s2, 2s1. With fluorine, can accept that. Uh, I'm going to do this inverse so that we can see our electrons kind of get near each other. 1s2, 2s2, 2p5, right? Okay, what would we expect to happen to the electrons that are going to form a bond? So first off, what electrons would we expect to interact between these two atoms? Okay, our 2s1 our valence electrons within our lithium, and for our fluorine, our valence electrons within our fluorine, which would actually go all the way back to our 2s. Okay, why is this kind of important? Well, we're going to bring these two together. What would we expect to happen? Well, if we take a look at our trends for electronegativity, okay, Lithium has a very low electronegativity, which means its ability to take bonding electrons is very, very low. It does not want to take the bonding electrons. Fluoride, on the other hand, is the most electronegative, meaning it's going to take electrons as swiftly and quickly as it can. So what are we going to expect to happen in this compound? When we bring those two atoms near each other, any guesses? They're going to react, and lithium will give up its one electron to our fluorine. What happens to the lithium if it gives up its one electron? It becomes positive. What happens to the fluorine if it gained an electron? It's now going to become negative. We said charge was bad, right? So what's going to happen in the case of this compound? 
we're going to want to match those two charges with each other. And what we've now formed is a bond between these. Okay? We now have a bond between the lithium atom and the fluoride atom. Okay? So our electronegativity can give us some idea of what's happening in our overall structure okay? or in our compound. So this is what we're going to shift into when we start to look at both 12, or sorry, when we look at just chapter 12. Chapter 6 is going to be all about nomenclature. Okay? So keep this idea of electronegativity in the back of your head. We'll keep coming back to it again and again and again. Okay? Why is it also important? Well, we just said fluoride became negative and our, sodium, or our lithium became positive, right? Well, what we've generated in those cases is now not lithium metal and fluorine gas, but we now have lithium ion and fluorine ion. Not fluorine ion, but bear with me. Okay? Our chemical properties have now changed about those two atoms because they've changed their electron configurations. Okay? So there's a couple neat things that come out of this we can now predict what charges atoms are going to become. Okay? Would we expect fluoride to gain an electron? Well, based on its electronegativity, absolutely. Would we expect lithium to gain an electron? No, because its electronegativity is so low. What would it rather do? Give away an electron. Okay? In that case, we get lithium ion as a plus. Okay, and that's kind of based on our electronegativities. Why would it want to give up those electrons? So why is the electronegativity really tell us anything about that? What's happening when lithium gives away its electron? It's a good thing I erased my configuration. So with lithium, I said it was 1s2, 2s1. Fluorine, I said it was 1s2, 2s2, and 2p5, right? If we move to lithium ion, what happens? What does lithium ion do? Based on our electronegativity, the lithium should lose an electron, right? So if we cross that out, this now becomes lithium plus. What has the formula or electron configuration of 1s2? <coughs> helium. What's special about helium? It's a noble gas, also known as an inert gas. Our atoms are trying to strive for neutrality. Okay? In the process, we end up having to become charged. We're trying to get our electron cloud to look as inert as possible. So our atoms are trying to shift and make it look like those noble gases. In the process, it does have to become charged. But what we're concerned about is that electron cloud. That's going to be the first thing to interact with everything else. So an individual atom will effectively change its clothes so that it can look like a noble gas and look less reactive. Okay. Does it become less reactive? There's an interesting question. What happens when you throw lithium metal into water? Get a minor explosion, get some flames, not a big deal. Okay. Anybody know what happens when you throw lithium ion into water? A little bit questionable, so let's move down to something that we might have heard of or talked about already. How about sodium? Throw sodium metal into water, what happens? Bad. <laughs> That's a good way to describe it. Big explosion, flames, all sorts of bad stuff. What happens when we throw sodium ion into water? Okay, it dissolves. Have we ever dissolved sodium ion into water before? What's salt water made out of? Sodium ions and chloride ions. Okay, another thing that we could evaluate, sodium ions. Do we need those to live? Those are part of our muscles. Our muscles actually function by pushing sodium and potassium ions across membranes. We're not pushing the sodium metal across because that would react rather violently with the water in our bloodstream, and we'd have a problem. Okay, we'd have our muscles exploding and not in a good way. Okay? So what happened to the reactivity for our lithium? Lithium metal was super reactive. Lithium ion 
not so much. Okay? And it has to do with that electron configuration. What's reacting when we go through and do an individual reaction? Our valence electrons. Our charge is due to both the protons and the electrons. When we're looking at our chemistry, we're really concerned about the electron cloud. Okay, what's happening with that? Okay, so it's kind of a neat concept to evaluate. If we go through and look at fluoride, what do we say happened, or sorry, fluorine? What do we say happened to fluorine in the process of the reaction? It gained an electron, so it took one of lithium's electrons, which means its configuration would become 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. It has to gain that extra electron. So we would have our electron configuration now of 2p6. If we were going to write out our fluorine, we can't write just F anymore because F assumes that there's no charge. We'd have to write F minus to represent that it accepted that extra electron. What does 1s2, 2s2, 2p6 look an awful lot like? Neon. Neon. Why is that important? Neon's also a noble gas. Okay? Our charges can be predicted based off of their electronegativities, and our electronegativities come from each of our elements trying to look like, as best as possible, a noble gas. Okay? So we're trying to alter that electron configuration in some way or another to make it look like the electron configuration of a noble gas. Okay. So what happens if we go back and pick another two? Let's say magnesium and phosphorus. Okay. Magnesium is a little bit further down the periodic table. We could go through and look at what noble gases it w could be. Okay. In general, we might say, well, it's just going to be the closest one. So if we jump, okay. most people say, well, that looks like argon. How many electrons would it have to accept? six electrons. Okay, how do we know it's six? Magnesium, magnesium plus one electron, plus two electrons, plus three, plus four, plus five, plus six. I have to gain six electrons. Well, what you should envision is not so much the periodic table as this flat piece of paper, but take it and roll it. Okay, fold the edges up on itself. If we do that, what is actually the closer noble gas to the magnesium? We can go a shorter distance. Oh, it's flat, so this is going to be hard. To the neon configuration. What would magnesium have to do to look like neon? It would have to give away two electrons. So we can either gain six electrons to look like argon, or we can lose two electrons to look like neon, which is easier to do lose the two. It's just a numbers game at that point. Okay? So the result, magnesium would carry a plus two charge. What about all the elements underneath magnesium? What would we expect of them? Exact same thing. Why? Okay. One big reason, why did we group elements within an individual column? They all have the same chemistry. Why do they have the same chemistry? Because their electron configurations are all similar according to a pattern. Okay? So if we shift to calcium, now calcium wants to look like argon because it's the closest. To look at to argon, it has to lose two electrons. It becomes that plus two charge. So you could go through and memorize the charge for each of the atoms on this. That's a lot of work. Or you could go through and say within group one, what's the charge? One. Group two? Two. Okay. It's a little bit different when we jump to the other side. So we looked at fluoride. Let's erase everything. We looked at fluoride and we said it just gained one electron, right? Just did that little jump to neon. What happens if we look at chloride or chlorine? Again, just gain one electron. What's the other option it could do? It could lose... could lose a whole heck of a lot of electrons. In that case, it'll end up losing, maybe got the number handy? Seven. Seven electrons to shift to neon. How could you figure that out quickly? 
How many electrons does chlorine start with? 17, according to its atomic number. If I want to get it to look like neon, how many electrons does neon have? 10. How many electrons do I need to get rid of? 7 to do the math. Okay? So which is easier, lose 7 or gain 1? Gain 1, what happens? Chlorine gains 1 electron. Okay, what happens if we shift to something like uh, sulfur? Gain 2 or... Lose six. What happens if we move to phosphorus? Gain three or lose five, which is more likely. Gain three, so we get that negative charge. Anybody see a problem potentially occurring in this next column? Let's jump up to carbon. Carbon could gain four or lose four. Which way does it go? Either way. So what's going to determine what charge carbon picks up? The other elements bound to it. If it's bound to a bunch of metals, carbon's going to take the electrons away and carbon will gain four. If it's bound to a bunch of non-metals, what's going to happen? It's going to lose four. So carbon's in kind of that weird transition spot. All right. What happens when we move? Boron's apparently a tricky one. Still not quite sure why. If we jump to right underneath boron, what happens with aluminum? What are our options? We can either gain five or lose three. Which is easier? Lose three. There's our charge. Okay. So you can take advantage of the periodic table and the elements' relative positions to our most stable uh, mol or sorry, atoms are noble gases to determine their typical charges. Okay, you'll notice that there's a pretty big empty section in the middle of the periodic table. Okay, what's going on through here? What elements do we have there? Transition. Our transition metals. What's our valence electrons? Where are our valence electrons with those? The d orbitals. Okay, remember we've got the s block. D block and P block. Why do we not look at the D electrons to figure out our charges? Kind of comes back to too big. We get all sorts of different possible arrangements where we can shift those charges in and out. So most commonly within that area, your transition metals will carry different charges. Well, if the charge changes, how are you going to be able to predict it? You're not, okay? So you wouldn't be expected to have those memorized. The ones that we would expect you to memorize would be your first two columns as your plus one and plus two. First column within our P block should be plus three. And the next one, that was our weird one, could be plus four or minus four. Next one, negative three. Next one, negative two, negative one, and <coughs> zero. There's no reason for it to give up or lose electrons. So we can, again, go back to our periodic table and pull information out of it without having to spend the time to memorize both the sodium, or sorry, our element name, our element symbol, its atomic number, its atomic mass, and charge. Our periodic table gives you a whole lot of that. The only thing it doesn't give you is the name. Okay. Kind of makes sense? Okay. So... Chapter 4 is a general summary. I'm going to push through this pretty fast. Um, things that you guys should be picking out of this would be our cool scientists from Chapter 4. You got Domson, Domson, Dalton, Thompson, Milliken, Curie, Rutherford. Um, the two ones that you're going to have to be a little bit more careful with would be Milliken and Curie. Why would those two be a bit more troublesome? Were they in the textbook? No, we only talked about them in the lecture. Okay. So go back and review our, the t lecture slides about what was happening with those two. Okay. Your subatomic particles, protons and neutrons. You'll notice I didn't include electrons there. Why? First part of Chapter 4, we only looked at our protons and neutrons. 
right? Because our electrons did that whole light stuff, which is a pain to deal with. All right. Then we moved into the wave nature of light. You need to know the difference between continuous and discrete. The textbook apparently shuffles back and forth, or maybe it's my fault, between discrete and the other big word, quantized. Those mean the same thing. All right. Continuous is a full line or a full spectrum. We don't see any blanks or black spots within uh, a continuous range. If we're looking at discrete or quantized, we see steps. So a ramp is continuous because it runs smoothly downwards. Whereas a staircase is discrete or quantized because we have distinct energy levels or distinct plateaus within it. Okay. Uh, Bohr, oh, that was kind of funny, was a discrete gentleman, meaning... What was Bohr's theory? Where did our electrons exist? In discrete energy levels. Okay? Okay, I thought it was funnier than you did. <laughs> Irrelevant. Okay. Orbitals are our electron homes. So we talked about the wave nature of light to get Bohr to go through and say we've got distinct energy levels for our electrons. We then referred, those, referred to those energy levels as our orbitals. Okay, so those are our electron homes. This is where we can reintroduce our subatomic particle of an electron because now we actually define where it's located. We have a little bit more information about it. Okay. Once we've got electrons, we've got the electron configurations, our 1s, 2s, 2p, how those particularly fill all the way up. Uh, you should be aware of where your exceptions fall. So when we fill up to the 3p, what's the next orbital? 4s, then 3d, okay? And we talked about that issue. You can expect to see at least one problem on that, but probably not much more than one, okay? Maybe two at most, looking at that kind of confusing section where we don't go based on energy levels. What was your question, Mark? Um, you said there was only two questions as far as configurations. As far as that exception. Oh, okay. Okay, so we aren't filling according to our energy levels. Next part of that, when we get our electron configurations, there's a couple things we could look at. Number one, shorthand, using the noble gases to evaluate or condense our configurations. The other thing that was more important, when we're using the noble gases, we're using the noble gases to represent our core electrons because really all we want to see are our valence electrons. The valence electrons are what are going to contribute to our bonding and everything else. Okay? Questions about chapter four? Chapter five, we've got Mendeleev equaling our periodic table. So that's kind of important. You should be able to predict things based off of the periodic table, given some important trend information. Uh, trends, your atomic orbitals, or sorry, your electron orbitals, how do those predict out of your periodic table? What things can you get out of it? Okay, so your S block, P block, D block, F block. Um, your chemical and physical properties, okay, which goes back again to Mendeleev's uh, processing. He went through and organized things based on this, so this goes back to your predictions. Atomic radius, okay, we talked about atomic radius and the trends that we would see within our periodic table. You need to know those trends. Ionization energy, you also need to know, um, again, with the trends. Last one would be ionic charges. You'll notice the big thing that's not on here the electron affinity. I don't expect you to know that um, beyond that it changes the charge. Which way does it change the charge? So electron affinity is grabbing an electron from the vacuum. What charge would happen to our atom if it took an electron from a vacuum? It becomes negatively charged. Okay, so I expect you to know that about the electron affinity. I don't expect you to know anything about the trends within that. You'll also notice electronegativity isn't on there yet. That's because, for some reason, the textbook decided to put that into Chapter 12. Okay, so I introduced it a little bit earlier. You will be responsible for electronegativity. It just plays a larger role in Chapter 12. Okay. Um, questions about Chapter 5? Okay.
So what we'll go ahead and do, give you a couple minutes, go through and do a quiz. Maybe I'll give you more if it takes you more, but we'll stick with three for the moment. shorthand notation, you're fine to do that too. Yes, it does substantially make it easier. about two minutes. 